Welcome to the Wake Before the Day podcast with my parents, Clark and Bonnie. We'll talk about the Bible and the Holy Spirit adventures. Thanks for listening. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to your Monday podcast. Today we're in the studio, and we're going to be looking at John chapter 15, which arguably might be one of the more popular chapters in the Bible. Love Jesus your is wife. saying, I'm the vine, the bread. Yeah, yeah, love your wife. Definitely in there somewhere. Don't listen to that. Either. Um, Jesus is talking about the vine and the branches. Right, yep. And uh, recently we are... We couldn't find a place in our backyard to like successfully garden or plant things. Well, we can't. There are places in our backyard, but, but we just don't like want to take up the space. It's the dead center where our kids play. And that's like high real estate. Yeah. yeah. So kids play there. So we attempted to build a greenhouse <laughs> in the back of our house that now has things growing. It does. There's enough sun exposure. It's it's good enough. We have some right things now. that are starting to vine and blossom and grow. So it's yeah. like, hey, are, this whole yeah. natural talk of growing in vines and branches yeah. and seeds is connected to what we're talking about today. Yeah, it's fine. And Jesus kind of overall point is like we're connected to him. We get our nutrients and our he's our life source. Yeah. And when you're connected to him, you can actually cultivate a fruitful life. That's the only way. Which should mm-hmm. be the end goal of the Christian, like worshiping God and yeah. being loved by God, loving him back. And then out of that's going to come kingdom fruit. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit. But Let's dive in. Well, one of the things that just stands out right away is he just says, like, I'm the true vine. Mm-hmm. My father's the gardener. And it, basically, our identity is found in that reality. Right. Just boom. like a strawberry can only come from a strawberry plant yep. or a cucumber thing that's sprouting out is coming from the system that is the cucumber. And yeah. for us to find our identity as a Christian, it can only be found in Christ. It can't be found in the church. Mm-hmm. It can't be found in a country. It can't be found in a job mm-hmm. or a status. It's actually your connection. Mm-hmm. To Jesus via relationship. Well, I like how he says the true vine, yes. because that's like, you might be able to find life in something else for a time. And I feel like that's a lot of the promise of, of idols is like, oh, this is exciting. There's a spark, there's energy, there's life. There's, you know, this is promoting something there's that I'm pleasure, really- There's pleasure. There's some kind of, so there's yes. something that brings satis- temporary satisfaction. Yes. That's like, oh, this is good. For a minute. Right. And so referring again back to Israel and the kind of language that was used in the Old Testament, knowing that like, no, it was Israel, like in Psalm 80, that is connected and rooted in Father, like in Yahweh. That is the one true source. So like mm-hmm. you said with the, the the plants, I feel like that's such a... It's such a pointed, even though it's so simple and little, like this is verse one, you have to start there. You have to understand that because just like growing something, it starts from like this little, is it going to be a weed? Is it going to bear fruit? Like, what is it? It all Mm -hmm. starts from this little seed. So understanding this truth, even though it seems so small right now, we we are spinning in confusion about purpose and identity and where to find those things. And so this this little reminder like hey verse 1 here's the truth. Be connected it's me. to yeah. The true vine the is true the vine. father. Love that. I love it. And then after that though he basically says if you're not like truly a part yeah. of me and you're fruitless I'll cut you off. Mm. That's like a a word of judgment. Mm-hmm. But then he talks about the importance of pruning which Is really important for us. This is what it says at the end of verse two and verse three. It says, while every branch that does not bear, that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me and I'll remain in you. Mm -hmm. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Right. And so we've actually watched this like live as we're trying to grow things. We have a couple of plants in our backyard yeah. That it like actually grieved my heart because it took a while for us to find one that would grow up over this water feature we have. And we read that you need to cut this thing back like 12 inches above the pot. And this thing right. is like, I don't know, the, the, the what's that per- pergola or what's that? Uh, this is good language. <laughs> what's that wooden structure that's over the water fountain called? Yeah, I think it's a little arch pergola. It's not big Something. though. I feel Anyways, like a pergola is It's like is what, smart. six and a half feet tall by three feet. <laughs> Anyways, this plant vines a lot and grows and there's tons of flowers on it. It's Mandevia. Like, yep, Mandevia. The and they're like, cut it down so it's 12 inches above the pot. Yep, so we, the we did. Yep. And it's just been really fun for me to watch every day there be new um, flowers come right. out, new leaves. And it's even the second year, it was way more fruitful. fruitful. Yes. There was more flowers. Right. There was more leaves. It was thicker. And it's like just so almost counterintuitive to say, I have to cut this back again. Boom, it grows even more. Yeah. 
And when it comes to our life, Mm -hmm. the Lord gives us, I would say, seasons of pruning, just like there's seasons for vegetables and fruits and plants where it's a season of growth. It's a season of maybe life being dormant. Mm -hmm. Maybe you don't sense a lot of Holy Spirit movement. There's not a lot of emotion to it. You haven't had any crazy Mm -hmm. encounters. It's just mundane. Mm -hmm. It's a grind. It's that marathon of life. You actually need those seasons. The Lord says he uses these seasons, whether it's a pruning or a growing, to help us become more fruitful in the kingdom. I think, like you said, those are seasons where we don't really want to spend a lot of time yeah. And even I think the imagery, so we kind of laugh about it with this little mandevilla plant that's in a pot, but the imagery of, uh, I mean, specifically of, um, I'm thinking of the vineyard, like mm-hmm. of an actual vine that's producing grapes, those roots and like that, type, that goes so deep. Mm-hmm. And so when whether it's a trimming, like this is speaking about in verse two, just trimming off a branch so that it'll be more fruitful. Or it's like, we're talking about like seasonally bringing the whole entire plant like way back down so that the life can concentrate at the root ball. That's what's going on is we're, you know, these, these um, saplings, these extra branches aren't producing. So we're bringing the focus and the attention back down to where it needs to be. And I love that the verses continue after, so we talked about the pruning in verse four, remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit because the focus comes back to the vine again, the main, not the branch, but the vine. And yeah. then throughout the chapter, Life that's source. the focus is remain, abide. Yeah. And that language is that is the same, that you won't be able to produce fruit. You can't, apart from me, you yeah. can't do anything. And that's what happens in verse seven and eight. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, that, that's important. There's a yeah. connection to God, the vine, and his words, mm. the scriptures. If my scriptures remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it'll be done for you. Mm. There's like that, that formation to your identity and your will being in alignment with God's. It's not saying you want a lotto ticket, you're going to get a lotto ticket. It's you're going to actually care and long for the things of the kingdom of God. Right. When you do that, God's saying, I'm going to allow you to have a fruitful ministry. Hmm. Um, This is to my father's glory, verse eight, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. And so one of the things I took away from this is this is kingdom of God metrics. Like, Hmm. because often it's, it's important to analyze growth. And so if you're uh, lifting weights, you're going to have a chart that charts how much weight you've gone up. Maybe sure. you did three sets of 10, you benched 185 pounds and 205 and 225, you know you're growing. Yes. So when it comes to your spirituality though, in a church, sometimes the metrics are hard. People can go look at attendance, look at baptisms, look at partners in mission, look at membership, these kind of things. Hmm. But you can still do all those things and not like truly 100%. grow yeah. In Christ's likeness. And so the fruit imagery kind of leans into that Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit. Right. And the kingdom of God metrics is, are you growing in love? Are right. you growing in joy? Are you mm-hmm. growing in peace and patience and kindness? And that list goes on and on. And those things can only happen if you're connected to the Lord and the Lord's word is in you. Mm-hmm. So those are kingdom metrics. If you want looking back at the last month or the last year, you're reflecting going, have I grown? Yeah. How have I grown? Mm. I would say, you know, you can look at how much have I read the scriptures and what have I memorized? What have I thought about? But the kingdom metrics often go through the relationship of Christ Mm -hmm. and are those descriptors. Have you become like him? Mm -hmm. And love is the greatest of them all. Are you loving God and are you loving others? Yeah. And so there's that kind of that fruit that's listed there. Um, And in it too, whether you have an ESV or an NIV or depending on what version you have, some of the versions say remain in me, other versions say abide. And basically what it's saying is there has to be a connection and it's a mutual relationship that goes both ways. Right. Um, There's a mutuality there that we have to be connected and God's there for us. He's offering us life, but we have to remain connected to him. And just like prayer and reading scripture and confession, there's a back and forth, just like our relationship. Right. We're talking, we're getting to know each other better, even after 12 years of marriage. And the same is true with the Lord. Yeah. That's what we're called to do. Well, I think too, you nailed it because, so the word that continues to pop up all the time is like you said, this word abide or remain. And in the message adaptation, it's actually the word live. And mm-hmm. so it's funny because I feel like that's so plain. Like that's such a plain language I appreciate it. Cause like, oh, that makes sense. Like, you know, living day in and day out connected to the vine. That makes sense. And then really we were talking about in the Greek right before this, um, the, the word meno, 
which we learned, uh, it can be translated to um, remain, to live in the same actual verbiage. Another picture, though, is trusting and resting. Mm. And I like that because so much of our life with God is this receiving. We're receiving. We're receiving because we're trusting, because we, we know that God's a faithful God. Mm. And so it's out of that connection that we can even bear the fruit, like you're talking about. And we can even we can even extend love. Like that's how um, the very end of this section, which is verse 17, this is my command, love each other. The only way we can even do anything connected to love is by receiving it from the true vine, verse one, God the Father. And, and the mutual relationship is so, like that's all over the Bible because... It, even just in the chapter before this, in John 9, he's talking about, if you love me, you'll follow my commands. Yes. So that's another way that we can, I mean, you're saying kingdom metrics, but why, how we, there's a song I used to sing in VBS and growing up that was like, you'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love, by our love. You want to sing it for us? No. And so I think oh. that's, that's the truth. <laughs> Honestly, that's the truth. And and you know that when you're on the receiving end of it too, yeah. when someone, you know, is, is maybe loving you and you're kind of being a stinker or they're loving you and you're hurting or they're just loving you because they're in Christ. Like yeah. you see that in them too. Like uncle or pastor Ken always uses the language, you know, their face was shining. Their, ca- <laughs> their countenance was bright and, and godly. Yeah. You know, that's their connection to the Holy Spirit. And it, I that is a real right thing, on. though. You definitely yeah. can tell. You can look in people's eyes yes. and their countenance and tell right away when someone is experiencing life and some or someone is not. Sure. But verses 9, 10, and 11 yeah. just affirm exactly what you say. There's this yeah. link between love and obedience. Yeah. If you 100%. really love me, then you will listen and be here and a doer. Mm-hmm. And so verse what verse 10 says, if you keep my commands, you'll remain in my love, just as I yeah. have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I've told you these things that my joy may be in you. And that your joy may be complete. And yeah. so this connection between uh, love and obedience. And then what happens, though, in the next couple of verses is when you do this, when you're connected to God and you're yeah. obedient to his word, his words in you, your position before God changes. And so if you mm. almost think about lovers and it's like, hey, we're friends and then we're dating and then there's an engagement and then there's a marriage like there's a there's a change and uh, a transition from positionship into a new relationship. Mm. Then when you get married, not only are you together, but then like your family has become my family, and right. your parents consider me a son. Yeah. And there's this transition that occurs where now yeah. I'm in a different standing before you, mm. and that's what he's getting at here with the Lord. He's like, you're my friends. Yeah. If you do what I command, mm. no longer do I call you servants because a servant doesn't know his master's business. Yeah. Instead, I've called you my friends. In other places, he calls you brothers and sisters, children of God. Mm-hmm. For everything that I have learned from my Father, I've now made known to you. And I think that's just such a encouraging word, like when you said earlier, there's a sense of drive and longing for purpose, for destiny, for direction that that is in every human being. Yeah. And when you're connected to the vine, he's given you real life. You have that purpose. Sure. You have that belonging. Hmm. You're like, I'm loved, I'm seen. And that does something for your heart. That is, you know, words are hard to even come to at times to describe it. You just know that you're connected to the Lord. Yeah. You feel loved. Um, Jesus though, kind of was like, Hey, this is all good and fun and dandy language. But just so you know, when this happens, <laughs> the world's going to hate you. You're like, all right, back yeah, to, re- back to reality verses right. 18 through, uh, 25, 26 mm-hmm. really. And, uh, Jesus says, if the world hates you, keep in mind, it hated me first. Yeah. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. And so you just think about celebrities and people who are, um, rich and famous and in the headlines that are doing I would say perverted worldly sure. things now are just getting heaped with praise and they're upholding worldly agendas and movements and it's pagan and it's ungodly and it's demonic and the world's loving it. And yeah. God's like, when you stand up against that, they're going to call you names. They're going to call you right. oppressor. You're a bigot. You're a hater. You're the list could go on and on and on. So that should not shake us. We smile and we talk kindly. We're not yelling at people. We're not name calling, but you speak the truth in love. Say, right, out of this yeah, is what the we're supposed to have. do. Like yeah. I, I'm because I'm connected to God and right. I see what you're doing. <laughs> like if I see someone walking across the street and I see a car barreling down the road, yeah, the most unloving thing I could do is just sit back and watch and let it happen. Like yeah. oh, let's let them get plastered by the semi driving right. down Alondra. Instead, it's like, stop, don't mm-hmm. do it. Come back, please look out. Here it comes. Right. That's what we're called to do. Mm-hmm. 
and in that you do that with wisdom and and in context with your relationships and how you know these people, et cetera. But that's what we're called to do. And you stand before the Lord and you're in the Lord and the Lord is yours. There's a sense of conviction and courage that God will give you that um, you will fear him more than you'll fear the world. And uh, yeah. And, And I love too how this ends and I'll turn it back to you so you can chime in. But I love verses 26 and 27 and how mm. it talks about how the Holy Spirit is going to bear witness. The Holy yeah. Spirit is going to testify. Yep. And you want to read 26 and 27 for sure. us? Sure. When the counselor comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you also must testify for you have been with me from the beginning. And so as Jesus is telling them, hey, you guys stay connected to me. And by the way, yesterday's reading, John 14, he's like, I'm going to die, but don't worry. I'm going ahead to prepare a place for you. And I, I'm going to have this place set up. I'm going to send you my Holy Spirit. He's like, as Jesus leaves, he's not testifying about the Father and about himself anymore. Now the Spirit's here yeah. through the church, and through the Christian, continuing the gospel message of Jesus' death and his resurrection, continuing to preach the love of Christ and that the um, condemnation of sin and also this invitation to something way better. Right. And the Spirit's the one who testifies and, and brings us and moves us to do this. It's right. not that we do this on our own accord or our mm-hmm. own ability. It's God in the Christian that right. propels you forward and allows you to do this. Yep. And that's just a good word in the midst of, uh, hey, remain in me, your love, you're going to be fruitful. Everybody's <laughs> going to hate you. The Spirit's going to be at work in you, is going to yeah. help you, and everything is going to be okay. Yeah, I think that's why he uses the word counselor for spirit yeah. there because we need counsel and Absolutely. we need this. And like, again, he labels the Holy Spirit as a spirit of truth. Yeah. Like those things, it's like, wow, thank you, Lord. Thank you that you are who you say you are and who you say you are is the true vine. You're a counselor. You're the, the, yeah. you're the truth. You're the way, like we were talking about in John, all these things. It's like, we need that. Yeah. So thank you. On a, and Tuesday <laughs> night, we have young adults here. And this last Tuesday, we broke out into different groups and we actually mixed up the male and the female groups and it was fun. Um, we were talking about the, the scripture reading for that day. And one guy who's new, his name's Tony, he's newer to the group, been here a couple months, was talking about how he was playing a game with a bunch of extended friends and family and mm-hmm. many of them are not Christians. And I forget what the name of the game was, but you have to put this word up like on your forehead okay. and then people write down... Um, uh, an answer to the question that's on your head and you have to like guess what it is. Okay. And the word on this guy's head was myth. And another guy in the group said Jesus. And he and his heart was wrestling with like how do in in the in the context of a party with all these people I don't know. And oh, he's like, sure. how do I navigate this? And yeah. the guy next to him stood up and goes, Hey man, like I don't think Jesus is not a myth to me. He's very real. Hmm. And it ended up being like a good conversation. He was bummed that he didn't step up and join in as much as he would have liked. But I told mm-hmm. him, hey, you recognized it. There's going to be a second chance. Yeah. You got it next time. <laughs> right. I'm glad that one guy spoke up Yeah, amen. because he's like, hey, this is actually real. Yeah. You can't think that he's pretend. He yeah. was a real guy and we believe he was really God and he really died and really resurrected. I just believe that there's going to be opportunity for us to actually yep. allow the Spirit to testify to the goodness of Jesus in your life. Even today, the weeks to come, at opportunities, whether it's in your family or the grocery store, or just kind of run-ins you have in your normal mundane life. Allow the Holy Spirit to testify to the work of Jesus yeah. through you. Yeah. John 15. You guys, thanks for listening. Yeah. Hope you enjoy your Monday. We'll be back with you Wednesday, John chapter 17. Yep. Awesome. God bless you guys. Have a good day. See ya. The Lord bless you and keep you. Don't make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give him his peace. Have a great day.